Our talk is about forensic fails. Um, I'm this guy over here. I founded an e-discovery company uh, about 11 years ago. I'm a forensic examiner. I have done thousands and thousands of exams. I'm also an expert witness um, in state, federal court, etc. And I like cats. And my name is Eric Roby. <laughs> Hi, Eric. <laughs> Hi. All right, about this other guy. Um, hi, I'm Michael Perklin. You may remember me from other DEF CON talks such as ACL Steganography. Um, I'm a forensic examiner, uh, a cybercrime investigator, security professional. I've also done thousands of exams. Um, and I like to break things a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Don't break my cat. <laughs> All right, so our agenda today, we have got seven amazing stories full of fail. Uh, we're going to learn something about forensic techniques because that's what we do. And the fails today are brought to you by both the suspect and the examiner. And we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the names have been changed to protect the idiots on both sides. We've actually changed some of the facts to, to protect the idiots and um, it seemed like a good thing to do basically. Um, but because fail was not just one dimensional, we found many dimensions of fail in our research. We've decided we need to create a fail matrix. <laughs> 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 to explain how the fail. So this is just, I'm just going to explain how the fail matrix works. Uh, the first uh, level of fail is the user retard level. <clears throat> oh my god, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> Drink. 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 Uh, for the record, he, he was responsible for the keynote presentation, so this is definitely his fail. <laughs> this is my fail. I get 10 points. All right, so the punishment level depends on, you know, what happened. So this particular guy lost the case, uh, dollars distress cause, let's give this one five points and bonus points are just whatever the fuck I feel like doing. <laughs> His girlfriend left him in this case so he gets 35 points. All right, so let's get into the first one. This is the it wasn't me defense. <laughs> You may have heard this one before. <laughs> All right, so uh, we do a lot of commercial litigation and a really typical kind of case is a trade secrets case. And this is a typical example of that. So this guy, Bob, he was working in sales at Acme and he resigned his position and he decided to go work for a competitor. This happens all the time. And some allegations were made by his employer that he took some trade secrets. He took the customer list with him to uh, his new company. It happens. So Bob says, I got nothing to hide. Come at me, bros. <laughs> he didn't exactly say that, but it sounded good. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. So we started imaging the drive and we started planning the examination. One thing we frequently do is we look for deleted files in unallocated space. And unallocated space is the part of the drive that can typically contain deleted files. So it's, you know, when you hit shift delete and it doesn't go away, it ends up in unallocated space. So we look for stuff there. It's something we also do is we look for recently used files by common programs like Word, Excel, Acrobat, and so forth. And we might look for USB device insertion. We're basically looking to see how trade secrets got from, you know, Acme over to the new company. Um, the final, finally the drive finished imaging and I'm actually going to share something really cool today. It's a DEF CON exclusive, worldwide premiere. We found a new wiping pattern. <laughs> <laughs> This is actually real. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is real. <laughs> so, you know, Bob apparently had used some kind of data destruction program that can overwrite every bit of uh, space and unallocated, unallocated space. Um, he used a pattern that, however, was not really commonly used by Windows or any of the other utilities I've seen. Might have been something custom. So, you know, I thought, hmm, this might suggest something bad was happening here. Let's, uh, you know, maybe, let's, let's take another closer look at this. So we're going to, we're going to zoom in. We're going to look at this on a molecular level now. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> I think we need to zoom in a little bit more. <laughs> so what have we learned? I admit the first part was actually that the second part there was no Sarah Palin in this case. But uh, so data destruction can almost always be detected. Um, if you, even if you don't use a repeating pattern, it's still detectable. We see it all the time. There's artifacts left behind that could be part of the pattern or there's artifacts in the operating system itself. So we might not know what you've destroyed, but we'll definitely know you destroyed something. And all, oops. <laughs> this is the mic. Here you go. And also, <laughs> it doesn't work very well. <laughs> and mean phrases make people dislike you. So. Uh, what about your fail matrix? Oh, the we got to do the fail matrix. <laughs> All right, but da da. All right, 12. <laughs> Pretty retarded, I think. You know, the guy lost the case. He got sued. Um, under $100,000, so not a huge amount of economic distress. And I didn't really give him any bonus points here because it just wasn't that good. So <laughs> he gets 27. Actually, <laughs> you already fail. <laughs> Uh, I think we can blame that guy who gave me the beer. <laughs> All right. So this case was, was a lot of fun. Um, I didn't expect it to be fun when I started out, but it ended up being a lot of fun. Uh, I call it the Nickelback guy. You'll, you'll see why in a second. Um, so it was another allegation of stolen confidential documents. This guy, um, let's call him John, he left one company to go work for a direct competitor. Um, and the, his old company uh, uh, hired us to, to go in and take a look, take a look at his. Can we, get, can we get audio for this, by the way? We're going to need audio for this segment, so if you could turn it on. Um, so, so, yeah, this, uh, the company where he left, they asked us to take a look at his work computer to, see, to look for signs of data exfiltration. Um, we, uh, he worked on a lot of confidential projects, and they just wanted to make sure that uh, he wasn't taking these confidential projects to the competitor and letting them know what, what they were doing. So, right. <laughs> I totally said all that. Uh, so we, why is this not working? There it is. Uh, we opened up the hard drive um, to, to, start, uh, to start the analysis and we started finding all, all the same stuff that you typically find on a work computer. Yeah, there's some work stuff. Sure, some you know, evidence of you know, Facebooking. Uh, he's got a, an MP3 collection. He liked, he liked listening to music while he was at work. Uh, typical stuff. Uh, we found the confidential documents that um, we were asked to make sure he didn't take. So but that was to be expected because he, he did the work on this, um, uh, on this computer. Um, and almost immediately, something jumped out at me. And uh, well, we'll get into why it jumped out at me in a second. But um, his music collection um, became very interesting to me. Not because I love Nickelback, but because, uh, well, again, we'll, we'll get into this in a second. That would be fail. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm Canadian too, so I, 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 yeah, Nickelback's from Canada. Um, yeah, uh, if you take a closer look at this photo, something may jump out at you as well. Uh, th these are just MP3s, just songs. But the size of these files is, is a little bit off. Um, What's wrong here? <laughs> yeah, the extended play Nickelback. This guy really loved his Nickelback. So <laughs> these were actually a bunch of AVI files. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, these were just AVI files that he had renamed. Um, so. Uh, it seems that John assumed that nobody would listen to his Nickelback MP3s, which is probably a good assumption because I don't think anybody would listen to his Nickelback MP3s. Um, and he was uh, hiding something, but what was he hiding? Um, Look at this photograph. Look at this pho Prager porn. <laughs> This guy had a quite a big fetish for Prager porn. These were full length feature films of pregnant ladies banging. And, and they were just like, there's, there was a ton of them all over this guy's hard drive. Um, uh, well, we did have to analyze them to see what they were. But. <laughs> but. <clears throat> 
but uh, I, will, I will say that the specific techniques that we use to analyze, uh, they're trade secrets. So I can't tell you how much, <laughs> how much depth we went into when we were analyzing them. Um, but um, yeah, it seems John did a lot more than just work on his confidential project on that computer. So we had to tell the, um, the company that you know, over, over the last three years while he was working there on this confidential project, he was also doing other stuff. Um, they were pretty happy that he left anyways. <laughs> All right, so what have we learned? Um, examiners, when, when we take a look at, uh, at files on a computer, we don't um, uh, typically look at it within the nested folder structure. Like, uh, we, we don't have to go uh, um, into every single subfolder, go back out, go into other subfolders, back it out. We see it all in a big long list. Uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to, um, uh, to, to analyze stuff. Also, one of the very first things that we always run is what's called a file signature analysis. This is a special script that looks at the contents of every file and it compares what's inside the file with the extension. And if there's any discrepancies, uh, those files are bumped up to the top of the list to be looked at because the system knows if these don't match, something may not be right here, uh, a human should take a look at this. Um, I just said those things. And so at the end of the day, John's attempt at hiding his Prager porn actually made it bump up to the top of the list for me to take a look at. So. Uh, if you're going to hide something, don't just change a file name. That, that doesn't hide something. That, that makes me want to look at it even more. <clears throat> All right, so the fail matrix. <laughs> the re user retard level, I would say 12 because again, renaming a file is not data hiding. If you want to do real data hiding, you should have come to my ACL steganography talk. Um, punishment level 13, he lost his job, not only the previous company where he left, but the new company where he landed, um, he lost his job there. Um, Distress cause was zero. Didn't really hurt anybody. I mean, what you choose to do on your own time is up to you. Although he chose to do it on work time with work stuff. You uh, know what the bonus points are going to be for, don't you? Yeah, there's, there's going to be some bonus points, I would say about a nickel's worth. <laughs> uh, so that brings us to a grand total of 30 fail points. All yours. That is the fail sound, thank you. By the way, do you like the font that we're using? <laughs> Comic Sans. Can I get her hand for Comic Sans? Nobody uses Comic Sans. It's the most underappreciated font in presentations. Yeah, I, I don't know why we, see, we don't see Comic Sans in more business settings. I mean, we, really. We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back. It's a new movement. All right, so let's look at the just bill me later case. So our client, the ABC firm, they outsourced a key part of their business. They've been doing it for many years. And the part of their uh, business that they're outsourcing is on a time and materials basis. So there's a lot of invoices with hours and rates and that's basically it. It was several million do dollars a year on average that was being billed. And our client started a review project because they thought they were being overbilled. They thought there might be a little inflation and they wanted to figure out why things were looking inflated. Uh, they looked at some of the individual <laughs> bills and they saw uh, they thought things were taking a little bit too long. So we came in and we decided to help. So they had thousands and thousands and thousands of PDF format invoices. Now that's not going to do us a lot of good. Even if we OCR'd, if we, even if we apply optical character recognition to it, um, we've still got a lot of unstructured data. So I can't really, you know, I can search one or two PDFs, but when I've got tens of thousands of them, it's really difficult to do anything with that. Um, so where did we start? We didn't have a lot of clues in this one. So through the magic of court order, <laughs> we were able to go to this customer's uh, database, their network, and get an image of everything in their network including a billing database which turned out to be very handy. So we made a, a forensic copy of this database and it was in a proprietary uh, format. And so in order for us to do <laughs> forensic analysis in a database, we need to be able to get it into something uh, like SQL where we can do kind of standard queries. So we migrate it over, we do standard queries and we're looking at it and there's still no easy way to compare the, the PDF to the database. So we decided to reverse engineer the tables in the database. Sometimes it's easy but sometimes there are thousands and thousands of tables and when you don't have tech support or the developers you just have to figure it out. So it's a really slow laborious process but we did figure it out. We noticed that the audit logs were turned on in this, which happened to be particularly useful. <coughs> so 
we ran a lot of queries and versus the time build versus the audit logs and we found there was sort of a pattern of inflation going on because basically when you're billing um, on time and materials, all you're doing is you've got either hours or you've got a rate and those are the two things and they got overly inflated. <laughs> so these are these two things that you can change there. You can change time or you can change the rate. Um, but we found the audit logs were turned off by default and the IT folks, bless the IT folks, they turned the <laughs> audit logs on which was really, really, really helpful because we do a lot of database forensics cases and this is the only one we've seen where the, the audit logs were turned on. So we were able to compare basically um, the amount that was billed at the end of the day versus how many hours were put on up, up, up to that point and we were able to see a chronology. So maybe at the end of the day the bill was for $1,000 uh, but we saw that it was only $800 that was actually billed. So the, uh, the billing person, the database person who uh, basically was working with it, this person would change the hours and the rate sometimes and bump it up so it went up from like $800 to $1,000 on a typical invoice. They did this thousands and thousands and thousands of times. <laughs> so let's look at the fail matrix. So I didn't give the user retard level, uh, you know, too many points here because it was a billing administrator. Most people don't really know what's going on inside a database, most average people. So, however, they have to refund the money. <laughs> so they get 18 points for that. Over the last, like, uh, four or five years worth of money. Yeah, so it was, it was it a <coughs> lot of money. It was about $12 million actually. <laughs> so they get 15 points. I wish. <laughs> and um, bonus points, eh, systematic culture of overbilling. <laughs> they get 45. <laughs> okay. Um, this next one, I, I call it smokinggun.txt. Now, if you, if you work in the, um, in the forensic arena, uh, you, you've probably heard the term uh, the smoking gun .txt. It's it's the uh, it's the gag name of what you're always looking for in a case. Uh, it could be that record in a database. It could be that uh, internet uh, history record that shows that the guy really did uh, something bad. Um, it comes from the cheesy western movies where you know the the murderer's gun is still smoking after he shot it. It proves that he was the one who fired the shot. So in forensics, you're, you're always saying that you know you're, oh, did you find the the smoking gun? Yeah, found the smoking gun .txt. Uh, sometimes I wish it's as easy as finding a file named smokinggun.txt, but uh, you can only wish. Um, this is another inte intellectual property case. Again, you got um, a, a guy leaving one company to go work for another company, and the first company says, "Can you make sure he didn't do stupid shit?" And we were called in to make sure that he didn't do stupid shit. So we imaged the drive. Um, we kicked off our standard analysis scripts like the file signature analysis script that I told you guys about before um, and uh, opened up his desktop folder. Uh, I always like to open up the, the desktop folder of, of uh, every suspect that, that I'm examining because you can tell a lot about um, what a guy um, or, or a lot about the person uh, when you're looking at the desktop. Um, do they cram a lot of files in there uh, in an unorganized fashion or maybe everything is neatly packed away in the my documents folder? Um, just things like that. Or uh, are they arranged nicely or is it just all uh, smattered? Uh, it, it tells you a little bit about the person so you can get a little bit into the mind of, uh, uh, of who they are. And immediately I solved the case. Um, How did you do that? <laughs> so, well, this is the smoking gun.txt. Um, it, uh, <laughs> well, it's almost as easy as this. Um, With no, a so barbecue? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I opened up the desktop folder and I saw this. I'm hoping you can see that in the back, but uh, I'll, I'll read it out for you. You've got um, a folder on the desktop. Uh, you can see it at the bottom left there. The folder is called Competitive Intelligence. And in <laughs> inside that folder, we've got a PowerPoint presentation titled um, Blue, Blue, or Project Blue Book. We've got, um, uh, we've got some PDFs. We've got uh, a whole bunch of stuff about this Project Blue Book that this guy was working on from, from his old company. He was getting ready to deliver this presentation to the, uh, the executive leadership team of the new company, telling them everything about this confidential project from his old company. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so he didn't even make it difficult for me. Like, it was not only all this stuff was there, but he made a PowerPoint presentation describing it and, like, to deliver all, uh, all, the, all the knowledge for this uh, uh, to the ELT. Um, yeah, I just said that. 
<laughs> uh, uh, did we overbill for this? We're, Maybe we're we not should that have. last client. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pardon me? Uh, I don't even remember. Uh, probably, well, it took 20, 20 minutes, so we probably just billed one hour. Um, Michael, what have, we what have we learned in this case? Well, we learned that sometimes people don't even try. <laughs> Fail matrix. All right. User retard level has got to be an 18. I mean, uh, we could, but uh, we're, sorry, we're saving the, uh, the, the higher scores for some of the later stories. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the this numbers guy, are going up. You may have noticed. So. <laughs> yeah, each, so far each one's been going up. Um, yeah, he, he got an 18 for user retard level because if you're going to be doing this, don't leave tracks all over your computer. I mean, sure, if you're going to say, "Well, uh, they, they're going to be launching this new thing in August next year," that's one thing to say it, uh, to a person. But if you put together a whole presentation about the thing, you're, you're, that, that's fail. It's, it's fail. Um, punishment level is a 10 because he had to settle. Uh, he was obviously in breach of his uh, NDA from the old company. Um, and um, it cost him uh, 1.5 million in damages. Uh, so the distress caused is a six pointer and bonus points of 12 for zero effort. <laughs> this all adds up to the fail matrix score of 46. All right, next story. I hope you appreciate these amazing sound effects and video editing that I did. <laughs> uh, hold on, we need to put the presentation on hold. Uh, I have a problem. Which one's which? Uh, that one is mine on the left, your left hand. Are you sure? Because I want the one that has more. <laughs> <laughs> then the one with more is yours. <laughs> nice. <laughs> when? <clears throat> we'll be taking questions later. <laughs> All right, so the next one I call hiding in the cloud. Um, so once again, a top sales guy leaves a company and the sales just take a nosedive actually. And um, they think he took the customer list but they can't prove it. Um, they know that there's new customers, they know that there's old customers over at the new company but they can't prove that he's taking the customer list. So we image his computer and we start looking for the usual kind of clues. So for example, um, link files are a Windows artifact that show um, what files have been recently opened. They're a simple text file and they're pretty easily parsed and they've got a lot of information about uh, the location of the file, the date and the time, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we look at uh, a registry key which I just love the name of this. It makes absolutely no sense to me at all but you know somebody at Microsoft maybe had a couple of these <laughs> one day when they were working called bag MRU for some unknown reason. It, <laughs> Most recently used, but why bag? You guys are just full of great answers. So <laughs> anyway, sure, explain why it's named that, but it's still a fucked up name. Bag MRU, come on. <laughs> anyway, so it's a register key that can show user activity and it can show what files are inside a folder. So that's one of the things that we look at typically in a data exfiltration case. Um, jump lists, which are, um, that's actually wrong, it's from Vista forward we've got jump lists and if you look, look at your. Uh, that's a fail. That is should, a fail. Should, that should say Vista. I got to take a drink. Yeah, drink. <laughs> I just don't love Vista enough to put it in there. So, <clears throat> anyway, so jump lists are the thing on your taskbar. If you've got like five Word documents open and you see, you know, you, you click on it, you got the five. Those are jump lists, basically. And IE history, Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is so much more than just exploring the internet. It actually records things that you do without your knowledge, <laughs> like opening files. But we're getting no love. <clears throat> I'm not finding anything. Show me the love, baby. He's having a beer. All right, so we searched the IE history. And we found a .htm file that had some JavaScript in it pointing to files anywhere. Um, who's familiar with that site? It's very much like Dropbox, the same kind of concept, but it's more for business users, so it's got a really, a lot of really great auditing and logging and stuff like that. So if you're uploading and downloading files, you can uh, basically monitor and track them and so forth. That turned out to be a very nice thing because typically that's only in the user control panel, but we found this little .htm file with Bingo. some. Bingo! Ho 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 ho! <laughs> and we solved the case. <laughs> Timing fail, I'm sorry. Drink! <laughs> Drink! Drink! Bingo, we solved the case. 
All right, so what we got was the account ID, the upload times, the file names, everything. We got some sweet loving. We got ourselves some stolen files. Let's look at this little actual bit of JavaScript here. <laughs> I have changed the names of the file in this case, but you know, we got stolen file, recipe for Coke, for example, you know, just minor trade secrets. The user is the user account name, <clears throat> so we were able to subpoena that from files anywhere and figure out who actually registered the account. There is the folder that it was in, and this is really handy here, the date that it was uploaded. And we got a whole bunch of these. In fact, this is the first page of a, like a 80 page Excel report that I prepared, and these are all the file names that this guy uploaded. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> So the second part of the story is I'm going to go back. Another fail. Fail. <laughs> Which one do I drink from? Yes. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> All right. So the second part of the case, the opposing attorney, the guy representing the thief, handed us an Outlook CD and CD with an Outlook PST on it, and this is part of the discovery process. Discovery is a legal term. Um, in litigation where both sides are able to exchange evidence and in fact they have a, they're compelled to exchange evidence through the rules of the court. So he gives us a CD and um, it's got Outlook, an Outlook PST on it. The first thing we do is we look at it, there's not a lot of files in there and the first thing we do is we want to recover the deleted emails in a PST because we're forensic analysts and that's what we like doing. We like looking at people's emails. Um, so I'm going to show you the old school way of uh, recovering deleted emails. You use a hex editor, you open, crack open the PST and you change bytes 7 through 12 or 7 through 13, change them to zeros, save the file, then you use the Outlook repair tool which is built in with Microsoft and you basically repair the tool, sorry, repair the PST and what happens is you get <laughs> a lot of emails back. Now these are not the actual emails but you get tons and tons of emails back. And in fact in this case we got tens of thousands of deleted emails. And what was in these mails? Everything that completely turned the case around. So not only did we have this guy with all the uploads on those spreadsheets, uh, we also had all the emails about who was involved, what lists he took, who were the, you know, uh, all the people that were involved. We were winning. We went, we went to Charlie Sheen mode all of a sudden. So <laughs> um, and the funny thing is we were able to take all this information um, and at a deposition, and if you don't know what a deposition is, we get to ask questions of the opposing party. So we're asking them, you know, what happened? Did you guys steal anything? Did you take anything? No, no, no. We start pulling out these emails one <laughs> by one by one and the guy turns white as a sheet <laughs> and he spills the beans. And basically, you know, we do pretty well. So who deleted the mails, do you think, in this case? Hmm. Call it out if you think you know who Call deleted. <laughs> wow, people got it almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> they hired Saul Goodman, unfortunately. <laughs> and yeah, um, he deleted the mails. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. So what have we learned? Uh, he, the question was, did he claim privilege? Did he claim on the privilege emails? on the emails? He claimed privilege on some of them, but not on you know all of the ten thousand that he deleted. So IE history is actually really difficult to wipe. Is what we've learned. It seems to leave stuff behind. Um, we found a new artifact, which is actually pretty cool. Files anywhere this JavaScript artifact. I haven't heard this discussed anywhere before, so I think it's kind of cool. Uh, JavaScript files can give us love too. We like them. And uploading files still leaves traces. So and attorneys shouldn't mess with evidence. It's against the ethical rules in every state and probably every Canadian province and it can get you disbarred actually. So. Well, let's, let's look at the fail matrix. <laughs> <laughs> so the user retard levels pretty damn high in this one. We got fails on the attorney's part and also on the, uh, the ex-sales guy. Huge lawsuit. Three and a half million dollars in fees and damages <coughs> which our client all got back <coughs> basically. And 15 bonus points. The attorney might lose his license in this one. He hasn't yet. We don't know. We don't track that kind of stuff. <laughs> 51. We're moving up. <coughs> you ready? 
Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Fail. <laughs> Let's do this shit. That's so, winning. <laughs> this, uh, this next case was probably one of the most fun cases that I've worked on. Uh, right from the start, I could tell that something was, uh, was going to be a fun one. I call it the RDP bounce. You'll see why. Um, I was called in to investigate a network breach. Uh, the company told us, and they shared some information with us, that was evidence that uh, at least one computer had been breached. They didn't know why, they didn't know what, and they asked us to investigate and, well, to tell them why and to tell them what. Um, it was, it was a large company. They've, uh, they had a lot of computers. All of them were, um, were Windows based. Uh, thousands upon thousands of computers in offices all across the world. And um, in one of their offices, they, they noticed uh, this, this computer had been breached. So let's figure out what happened. So we move in. And um, actually, I think I'm just going to pause here for two seconds. Hey, Eric, is this your first time uh, presenting at DEF CON? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, we don't even have to say anything anymore. You guys know exactly what's going on. Is there any, um, uh -oh. I want to know, is Sarah in the room? Sarah? Sarah. Sarah. Show yourself. Sarah. <laughs> oh, yeah, which Sarah? Can we narrow that yeah. down? Yeah. <laughs> You, sir, is your name Sam? <laughs> Start boring. Start boring. What? All right, well, Bend over. We thought Sarah was going to be here, so we're just going to leave now. You are the ugliest Sarah ever. <laughs> Finish that. Oh, boy. Fail. Another soldier bites the dust. <laughs> Winning. Stop that. <laughs> Uh, Paul? Yes. There's some issue about uh, the sound person? Uh, no. Well, Sarah's supposed to be the sound person. Sarah's right here. You're talking about me, right? You know, I appreciate that, Sarah, but we were looking for a different Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> However, since she's not here, Sarah, would you come up? Please? Come on up. You're the next contestant on Will You Fail? Awesome. Thank you. Other Sarah's going to be <laughs> oh, you already got one. Someone counted wrong. Here, pass one for Sarah. All right. I'll be Sarah Sarah double. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sarah, and so is my wife. I'm sure all of you want to be Sarah right now. We already right, have to, Sarah Palin in the talk. So, to our new uh, speakers and to our uh, new attendees. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> two, two more this hour. <laughs> All right. We got 15 minutes left, so. Thank you very much, Goons, for, uh, for doing that. It's Eric's first time at uh, DEF CON, so. All right, so I was talking about the RDP bounce case that I was. Uh, uh, that I was investigating. Now, as I mentioned, um, thousands of computers, very, uh, various um, offices all around the world. Uh, so we analyzed the one computer that they knew was breached. And it showed that, there were, that RDP, or Remote Desktop Protocol, this is the, 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 the tool that's built into Windows that allows you to remotely control another computer. Um, some logs showed us that RDP was used to connect using the local administrator password to, an, uh, to another machine. Um, it also showed that, actually I said that backwards, it, it showed that RDP was used to connect in and it also showed that RDP was used to connect out. So uh, in this little diagram here, uh, it, we were, I was looking at the middle computer. I didn't know at the time that there were other computers. I was just looking at this middle one and it seemed that there were uh, a, a bunch used in here. Uh, so it was probably the tip of the iceberg. Um, where, where do you find these logs, Michael? Uh, specifically, uh, I was looking at the Windows event log, uh, the, the event viewer. If you go into the control panel and then the administrator tools, there's the event viewer tool. Um, by default, it logs a lot of stuff uh, in there, including when RDP is used to connect in and when you're connecting out. So I analyzed that, uh, the, the machine that came before it, and same, same thing, there were, uh, there were uh, logs that showed that somebody was connecting into that. It was 
basically an entire bounce. Now, these computers were located in different offices in, uh, all around the world. This guy was bouncing all around the world uh, to do something. So obviously this is a pattern. I still didn't know what he was doing. I just knew that he was clearly going through a lot of, of trouble to obfuscate his trail, uh, bouncing all around so that probably so that when he does hit his final target, there's no direct evidence to, uh, uh, to where he was coming from. Were they sessions within sessions? Yes. They were all sessions within sessions. So he opens up a remote desktop and then within that remote desktop window he opens up another remote desktop to another machine and he just did this over and over. It must have taken him hours because remote desktop is not the fastest protocol at all. <laughs> and so he must uh, like, I, I don't know, I, I don't even want to speculate how long it took him to, uh, to do this. Um, can you imagine how long the screen redraw was by the time you get to like machine 10? Jesus Christ. <laughs> you probably have to double click with like a minute in between clicks or something. Um, all right. So what was the target? So um, uh, I, th I think you can all uh, figure out what I would do next. Rather than following the trail back, I started following the trail forward. What was he getting? Um, uh, so I, uh, step after step, computer after computer, site after site after site, all around the world, um, I finally reached a high profile machine. I, I wish I could tell you uh, which specific machine it was. Um, I, I can't because it would uh, give away too much uh, um, about this company. Did it have Nickelback on it? <laughs> uh, it did not have Nickelback on it. Um, yeah, choppiest video ever for sure. Uh, so uh, once I reached this machine, I knew exactly what he was going after. Um, he, he wanted highly confidential documents that were only on this one machine in the entire company. And he obviously knew this and, and he wanted to get into this machine to get these documents. So I focused my analysis on this target machine, on, on, on this special confidential uh, machine. And I wanted to see what did they do. Specifically, which files did they take? Um, and uh, it, it took me only about two minutes as I was, I was analyzing this machine and I identified the attacker immediately. Now he went through all around the world and I, it finally when I was taking a look at his target, within two minutes I found out who he was. Uh, he used his own credentials on the machine? No, he did not use his own credentials on the machine. Uh, any other guesses? Emails to himself? Nope. He stole his own file? Nope. He did not check Facebook. He, no, no shared drives. Why don't I tell you what he did? Michael, what did he do? Printers. So, one thing that a lot of people don't know about remote, uh, remote desktop is by default it maps the printer connected to your machine to the machine that you're connecting out to. It does this so that when you hit print inside your remote desktop window, your printer next to you is available so you can print a document beside you. Now this guy didn't print any documents but just by connecting, he, um, the machine automatically mapped his local printer to the target machine which identified his machine, uh, uh, machine name. Um, he forgot to turn this off. There is a checkbox in remote desktop protocol. Uh, when you open up the, uh, the RDP window, uh, you can hit options and then uncheck map printers to target machine. It's just a checkbox. He did not uncheck it. <laughs> yeah. What have we learned, Michael? Well, what have we learned? Um, log entries that are uh, created uh, by innocuous uh, system events can give insight into user actions. Now, he didn't map his printer. The system did it automatically. So sometimes just looking at what the system is doing can tell you what the user was doing. Uh, for the fail matrix, um, user retard level would be about a 20 because uh, he went through a lot of trouble to cover his tracks and he did not cover his tracks. Uh, punishment level would be 15. He lost his job. Uh, he also lost his, uh, or his references. He can't use, use that company as a reference anymore. Um, so distress cause would be 8. Bonus points would be 20. Do some research. If you're going to use RDP to pull off some kind of a, a scam, know how RDP works. Um, adding it all up, we get a fail score of 63. <laughs> now the last uh, story. Here, Eric. All right, so the last, the last story is a little bit different than the others. Um, <laughs> this is the epic porno fail. So the difference in this one is all the other cases we've talked about have either been commercial litigation, civil litigation, something on that side. This one happens to be a criminal case and uh, from time to time we do criminal defense work. Uh, 
And we work either with public defenders or with private attorneys. And so this is about this kind of situation. So uh, our client, Edgar, has been charged with possession of contraband, aka child porn in his computer. Pretty unsavory stuff. Um, he claims innocence as usual. And I kind of roll my eyes because everybody always claims innocence and, you know, 98% of these people did it. <laughs> um, we examined the computer. We looked at the examiner's report. We looked at their allegations. And let's take a look at them. So they claim Edgar downloaded porn. All right. They claim that Edgar's user account had passwords. And this is all documented in the report. And they claim that Edgar utilized news groups to download porn. Like, for who, real? Who uses <laughs> news groups to download porn? Anybody? Oh, Anybody? Raise your hand. <laughs> I, I think they have the web now. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> News groups, right? So, <laughs> that guy, I would believe. <laughs> All right. So they they allege that he downloaded illegal porn, and there is one thing to note. Just to keep this in mind as we go through the talk. He left his house in April 2012. His wife kicked him out because of all this, you know, stuff happening, basically. So, April 2012. Keep that in mind. So let's look when we examine the computer. Let's see what we came up with. So first we looked at IE history. And as I mentioned before, IE history is able to show you when a file has been opened. So this is an actual example. I've changed the file name a little bit here. And what was the date that I just mentioned? April 2012. Okay. <laughs> I see some dates here. Are these before or after April 2012? Put up your hand if it's after. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, so, all right. One fail here. Let's um, look at his peer to peer software download folder. So, in the top there, I've got the, the path where these naughty files were downloaded. And it's a pretty typical path. These P2P programs change the, uh, the file name to something long. So it's like T dash something, something, something naughty file. Anyways, um, I'm looking at the dates here again. And Michael, do you have a calendar? Is, is uh, give me a second here. Is, Pull this up. When, when is December? Uh, it is after April. It, it's uh, after April. De okay. De definitely after okay. April. It's after April. Okay. Just, just wanted to check. We need to verify our forensic findings before we can publish them. So, you know, we're verifying. Oops. I think. Fail. Fail. Give me that beer. <laughs> All right. So they also claim that he used Outlook Express, really, to download porn. <laughs> Outlook Express. This is 2012, remember, folks. <laughs> it makes me wonder, did they even analyze this guy's machine? Where are they coming up with this stuff? We saw records of P2P, not Outlook Express. Outlook Express. All right. In reality, yes, Outlook Express was on the machine set up with an account called Porno Lover. <laughs> Okay. It was set up after <laughs> Edgar moved out of the house. And only headers were downloaded, no content. So, what do you mean by headers? So a header is, if you're using Outlook Express, <laughs> it is just the first part of the file. Uh, the email is going to have uh, the date, the send of the receiver, maybe the subject line, maybe the first couple words. But there was no content. There was no, no photos in there. Just headers with, you know, admittedly porno names. So they also, let's look at accusation number three. They say his user account had a password. And the inference is only Edgar was able to access it because there was a password. <coughs> let's look at the passwords, shall we? <laughs> Maybe we can zoom in a little bit on this. <laughs> This is actually a really cool utility. It's free. It's called LCP. I'll just go back to it for one second here. Um, it's a free utility. Um, it's really great for looking and seeing if um, there are passwords. Um, you can also use it to uh, perform an attack, although it's not very good. <coughs> All right. So more facts undiscovered by the examiner. Uh, the P2P client was used to download porn. That's the examiner didn't find that. Into a new user account called Porno Lover. Guess when? <laughs> After he moved out of the house. So we submitted our report to the prosecutor. It was like a five, ten page report, something like that. And the government dropped the charges. 
years after they charged this guy, they drop the charges. This does not ever happen really. Uh, this is the first time I've done thousands of cases and well, hundreds of hundreds of cases, thousands of exams. I don't know how many. It's never happened before. And this is after the guy spent a huge amount of money in legal costs. So to do all this, I just want to give a thank you to uh, Rob Lee and the Sands. Anyone know Rob Lee? <coughs> we use Super Timeline Analysis to do a lot of this work. Super Timeline is a really amazing piece of software that will basically go through the computer and look at all the computer generated artifacts and put everything into a nice chrono chronological sequence for you. So a really awesome piece of software. Yeah, definitely one of the best pieces of software I've used. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the government interviews Edgar's friend. <laughs> the friend confesses. <laughs> the friend did it. The friend was trying to get jiggy with Edgar's wife. <laughs> and he put the porn on the computer. And the court clears Edgar's name. They give him a finding of actual innocence. Never happens. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had many people claim innocence. And this guy actually claimed innocence, and he really was. Yeah. Rarely happens. I've been to court a couple times where there's been acquittals and we didn't go to court on this one, fortunately, but we would have. So what do we learn? Base your conclusions upon actual evidence. <laughs> Find multiple artifacts backing up your allegations, not, and I don't know where the password thing came from. Tie it to a person, not just a machine, if possible. Try to look at user activity that would tie specific events to uh, a person. So remember, the maximum you can get is 20 in any category. <laughs> However, I've decided to break the rules a little bit for this one. So examiner ineptness, he gets five bonus points built in <laughs> right there. Um, oh yeah, the guy sued the city for millions of dollars. <laughs> And, you know, there might be a job security issue for somebody in this case. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that examiner is going to really have a job much longer. <laughs> and 100 bonus points because the, for the court finds a suspect innocent. So, <clears throat> factually innocent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.